Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, the whole point of this isn't the entrepreneur component, but it is a huge component. Um, so where we do want to transform the maritime economy, um, at the end of the day, we also want student engagement and being able to support teachers and sharing the curriculum in a way that touches and engages the students directly. Um, so the Student Superpower Challenge, if you go to superpowerchallenge.ca, um, this is our third iteration of it, and now Nova Scotia has jumped on board. And so we literally have today 600 kids in Halifax all meet. We had some guest speakers. They went through a one-hour shop on how to do a Lean Canvas business plan, and we're trying to funnel them with four themes. So the four themes for the Maritime Challenge is this year, um, our people, our environment, our fashion, and I'm forgetting, our, did I say our community? Our community, our people, our fashion, and our environment. Um, so to use technology to solve those everyday problems kind of thing. And so from now until December 18th, and that's a picture from last year's, um, but it'll look similar this year. So from now until December 18th, we're hoping that these students, that the Department of Education of Scotia actually bust all these kids from across the province, 600 of them, to Halifax for this event, which was an education day tied around big data. Uh, I didn't mention big data as far as industry is concerned and technology, but big data is huge, right? Uh, how people move and the flow of everything and information and what we can pull out of that data to create stuff. Um, so anyway, as part of the Big Data Congress, we've got a student education day that we're, we help organize. And um, so the Department of Education believes in it because the Premier believes in it, because the One Nova Scotia Coalition believes in it, because it was informed by this thing called the IVNI Report, which was really alarming and saying, if we don't change what we're doing in Nova Scotia right now, we're going to be in even bigger trouble in five, ten years. Um, so I don't want to know the busing cost for this. <laughs> Some of them came from so far, they had to stay overnight in hotels with their chaperones. So this is how much the Department of Education and Government of Nova Scotia believes in this type of teaching and learning is they're spending a lot of money on it. Um, so we've got, we're hoping that these students, these 600 students, will go back to their kind of home schools and become ambassadors to try to create change and say we can make a difference. We don't have to just sit and watch the world go by us. We can use technology to solve problems that face us. So like those three problems I kind of really shared with you before with the solar heated uh, furnace and the fishing and trapping bracelet and the clothes sharing app, um, we're just starting to plant those seeds. And so I'm very excited to see what happens in the next five years with these maritime uh, entrepreneurship competitions. Um, and so now all of Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and possibly PEI, uh, will have till December 18th to submit their ideas. After that, it'll be like a Dragon's Den style thing. So after January 15th, 10 finalists from each province are going to be announced. And then we're going to have mentor support. So people from industry, depending on what their ideas are, right? we're going to set them up with people that can actually help them, not just some random person. Um, so trying to match them up with industry mentors to help them, not just with their idea and the development, but contacts, networks, all that kind of stuff. Because the private sector is hugely involved in this across all kind of uh, industries, whether it be tech or natural resources. People are starting to realize that they can play a role in the school system. And the schools I'm finding in Atlantic Canada are starting to open up their doors. Um, as a matter of fact, the Francophone schools in New Brunswick, they're called des écoles communautaires et entrepreneuriales. So right there, they've got this new branding that says we're an entrepreneurial and community school. And so people from the community are invited in and out. It's uh, in small, 700,000, maybe not as afraid of security issues, but there's still protocols in place. You still have to buzz in to get in. There's still lockdown stuff, but it's very open to the community to come in. Um, some of the maker spaces, um, they teamed up with the Crib Dodge Dogs, or, yeah, like senior clubs, and um, are we still majoritarily, is that even a word, English? Or are we kind of <laughs> anglophone? Yes? Yes. Francophone? Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, 
so the seniors are coming in and teaching, helping these kids learn how to sew and use a serger and embroidery machine, but then the seniors are also sticking around to see how the kids integrate the technology into it, which was a wonderful thing for me to witness because I thought, okay, they'll go in, they'll play with the kids, but no, they're fascinated with this conductive thread, these little tiny microcontrollers and how there's one school, they made little handbags and the little metal snaps act as the on-off switch. So when you open the handbag, it lights up inside, right? There's a school in the States <laughs> that have figured out, uh, it's online, the tutorials are free, uh, to put three little lights on the side of the handbag of different colors. And there's RFID tags that we've got in our maker spaces that these kids can either put on uh, your glasses or your wallet or your keys. And when they're not in your handbag, <laughs> that particular light will light up to say, hey, your wallet's not here, don't leave the house. Um, and so these are like middle school kids that are able to put this technology to use. Um, so the finals will be in February for this. So in the next three months, we're very excited to see what happens in the provinces over there. Um, and it's an ongoing thing. Like these kids, we supported for well over a year to develop their ideas and prototypes. And like I mentioned, Riley is in communication and is knee deep and a lot of patience is required. Um, you've got a pro bono McKinnis Cooper lawyer that's there to help with anything that comes through as far as um, what are the, it's called non-disclosure agreements that come from these companies. Um, and so as these kids come up with these ideas, we also have to add a layer of support, um, IP. There's only two lawyers in the Plant of Canada that are kind of IP experts to help these kids protect their ideas and it costs a fortune. So even now, yeah, it's great, let's create these maker spaces, but every good idea that comes out of it, we're gonna have to be there to support these kids that one, can we take it to market? Is it viable an idea? Um, do we have people that can help you protect your idea before some huge company steals it from you? Um, and this company's been, this large multinational company's been absolutely awesome with her. Um, it's, it's very cool to see this happening. Post-secondary, I didn't talk about that much, but we've also got relationships with uh, our Francophone and our Anglophone colleges, as well as universities. Uh, we do different things with them, like uh, middle school coding competitions. I talked about how the Department of Engineering in Fredericton is Skyping sometimes with students if they've got problems. I got a wonderful card in the mail at the end of June uh, from a kid in Miramichi. He's in grade 12, and he's like, thank you for all the support you've given us this year. Because of my experience, I'm going to UNB Fredericton to do robotics, right? So if he hadn't had those opportunities, had he not made a connection with that professor via Skype or whatever tool they use online, who knows where that kid would be right now. But at least he's lit up about something. He's engaged, he's passionate. Um, Yeah, this was an absolutely wonderful story. Um, the child was disengaged, um, and we know what happens with, when children are disengaged in a classroom, it can be kind of disrupt the fabric of the classroom. And this student, I don't think he was in the makerspace for 30 minutes when he had this awesome idea. Um, and you talk about PD for the teachers, nobody in that school would have the skills to be able to support this child in developing this idea. I remember I walked in there a couple of weeks after he'd gotten in and stretched stuff out, he was cutting the tip of his shoe with an X-Acto knife. And most educators would say, put that knife away, that's dangerous, what are you doing, stop. I'm like, what are you making? And then he explained to me his idea, it was wonderful. Uh, we have a francophone organization that partners with us called Place de Compétences in New Brunswick. And they sent Francois Léons, uh, who's got a background in computer programming. Um, so we, he went to the school and helped him with some of the coding aspects of it. Um, so now the next step is prototype two. Um, and then seeing maybe if it's viable to take further. I did some research after this and I found there's a group of uh, students from India that go to MIT and they've got a smart shoe, but theirs takes a satellite signal and downloads it to the shoe and it vibrates to tell you in which direction to go, but it's not gonna tell you if you're gonna smack your face into a wall. Uh, whereas this little guy who does do that. So it'd be nice to see something happen with both. Um, can I just, yeah. uh, have you ever used to scribbler robots with the kids? No. Do you know what they are? No. I, I don't know who makes them, but it's a little robot, it has a hole in the middle. You have the ability to put a marker in it, and then the kids can program it to move. To, and it has light sensors, cool. and it has like a Is it called the called scribbler, or is it the Ozobot? It's called scribbler. Okay. Okay. <laughs> There's another one similar that's called the Ozobot, but I don't know if there's an actual, you don't drop it in the middle, but yeah. yeah. 
I just when you're talking about the shoe, it must like it maybe he's using a sensor. Yeah. Oh yeah. There's definitely there's an ultrasonic sensor right that works like a oh, looks like a dolphin. Yeah. Um, so it sends and actually if I go back. You can see see the tip of the shoe, like two little circles. It sends a signal out and back and calculates the distance. So version 2.0. These Arduino microcontrollers are the size of a credit card, but you can also go get a low voltage one that's the size of the tip of my thumb. So that's probably what we'll end up using in the version 2.0, hopefully. And same with the buzzer. The buzzer is little bits, um, and little bits is a magnetic kind of circuitry thing where you can just basically, you can't make a mistake because you know how negative, negative, positive, positive pulls apart. Um, so these kids can snap all these little circuits together and sensors. There's even a cloud bit it's called and using if this then that online, you can drag and drop if this happens and that happens. And we've had kids within, I don't know, two minutes uh, send their parent a text when a little microphone picks up a sound. Um, and these are elementary school kids that are playing with the Internet of Things using these little little bit things over there. Um, so yeah, all said and done, prototype two, the ultrasonic sensor, it's probably two bucks when you buy them in bulk. A little buzzer can be less than a dollar, and the low power module is probably ten dollars. So you'd be looking at probably what fifteen dollars worth of technology for this shoot. It's uh, it's not too bad. Where do you usually get all your bits and pieces? Like sometimes I go to the source, like Circuit City, and Radio Shack. Yeah, no, unfortunately the dollar is hurting us right now because we get a lot of the stuff from the states and China, unfortunately because. There's not a there's a robot shop that has a place in Canada. There's Canakit out of Vancouver, um, but there's not a lot of Canadian suppliers for all this kind of stuff, and so we're losing a lot of our hard-earned dollars to the exchange rate right now as we import technology. And honestly, it'd be great to want to let the cat out of the bag. But like, obviously, I'm not going to share every single little detail of what the big plan is and the big vision in the Maritimes because we don't want you guys to steal it. Um, but <laughs> Right, right now, traditionally, Ontario is like the manufacturing capital of Canada. Um, what's stopping us from generating some of this kind of componentry in Atlantic Canada? I know there's a university, I think it's Acadia, they're developing their own 3D printer. They're calling it the popcorn printer because they can see it's going to be a billion dollar industry, if not already. Um, and so they've got plans in place. So we want it to generate employment and business and opportunities for careers in the Maritimes. Uh, this little fellow, he, uh, I think I was the second week on the job for Billion Labs and I went to uh, Northern New Brunswick Francophone School and I brought a 3D printer with me and a few other things. I was going to do some coding for, um, tutorial um, workshops with the students. And the very first class I visited, I put the 3D printer down in the corner, the class came in, and then a student walked in. He was about my size, um, maybe even larger. He was accompanied by his teacher and an educational assistant. They literally looked like prison guards. Um, he kind of came into the classroom, and I, I, I just gravitate to those, those types of kids. And so I invited him over to help me with the 3D printer, and he waddled over in French. So of course, the most of junk to do. Uh, right? Like, Where's this piece of junk to? Um, and he helped me calibrate the build plate. And as soon as he pushed that button, and the lights lit up, and that extruder came down, I had him. I saw the spark in his eye. All of a sudden, I was like, oh, that's what this does. And it hadn't even printed yet. And then it started printing layer by layer. And he watched it, and he watched it. And then um, at the break, uh, it was closer to lunch, he's like um, up on the stage. Again, it looked like a prison yard kind of scene, right? And I saw him talking to his little buddy, and his little buddy came over to me. He's like, he wants to know if he draws you something, can you print it out for him? Like, well, if he comes and asks him himself, of course, we can we can figure that out. So he came up to me himself a little later, he's like, yeah, if I can draw you something, will you print it for me? So I'm like, sure. Um, he came back with that little drawing of a hot rod about an hour later, and so I was generally impressed. Um, so he's like, can you print it for me? I'm like, yes. Um, and can I send you more? I'm like, yes, but, and then my educator brain, I'm saying, let's integrate uh, language art to this. You have to label all the different parts because I want to know what this thing does. So the next version, I don't have a picture of it up there, but uh, it was this crazy big hot rod truck with the jets and wings, and it was labeled and um, ended up 
printing it at home and uh, mailing it to them right after it was done. But that day, when that bell rang and that kid that came into that classroom and didn't want to be at school, at the end of that day, oh, and I had said, man, you're an awesome artist uh, and you're so technical, you should be an engineer. I left the important part out. At the end of the day, he's walking, he's got a school bag on, he's walking to his buddies. When I grow up, I'm going to be an engineer. Right? So I don't know where that kid is now, he's in grade nine, but I hope that maybe there's still something there that I can do something more than just not enjoy school and want to do something unrelated. Um, there's another, I'm not going to single them out, but there's a student in the middle there who also didn't want to be at school, part of an uh, Anglophone community in New Brunswick. And I showed up, and he just happened, I think the absentee rate for this child was staggering. Uh, I think he missed half the days of school. Um, I showed up, and just happenstance, he was there that day, and we did some coding and some robotics. Um, and from what I heard, is that he didn't miss a whole lot of school after that, because as the cherry that the teacher could dangle, I'll do some time to code and work on robotics. Well, then there, he ended up entering the provincial scratch uh, coding competition that we put on with the University of New Brunswick and St. John, and he finished in the top three. Yeah. All right. So again, this kid missing all this class time because he's not engaged, and then finding a creative way to get him back in. Um, and the kid's brilliant, right? Like some of the coding he was doing with scratch, I was scratching my head. Like he literally had to explain some of the stuff he did three times to me. Um, so that I can understand it myself. Uh, here, that was part of the rocketry program, so for the eight months, and then a small community PEI where traditionally it was either potato farming or uh, lobster fishing, and then it was seasonal, right? So we had people that owned a lot of big farms and a lot of many, many fishing boats, and then we had some students that weren't that lucky. They were working for the people who owned those boats, which meant that in the winter there wasn't a whole lot happening. Um, but there's a couple of students I had in grade six, again, a lot of behavior issues, always being sent to the principal's office in previous years. And I remember the teachers wanting to tell me all about these kids, and I'm like, oh, I'll just figure it out for myself. And they're called tune files, where you have to read their, their files. And I made a conscious decision that year, because I was usually always reading before. I'm not going to read it. I'm going to wait two weeks, and then I'm going to read it. And I'm glad I did, because I think that child, while he was in my classroom, might have gone to the office twice, and it wasn't because I sent him there. It's because he self-recognized that he was getting upset with stuff in the classroom, and we had made an agreement that that would be like his safe spot. Um, but then when he go to English class with Russell Hall, because I taught French version, um, it was a different story. So, but anyway, two kids, him included, hated reading. Um, so we got into the robotics, got into the computer program, and got into the rocketry, and we started off with little model rockets, and again, a lot of stuff in politics, and I had this money donated from the uh, private sector to buy model rockets, but then somebody didn't want a cash to check in because it would have made it look like government couldn't handle their business, and what's the private sector doing helping you? Um, anyway, Brilliant Labs came in, and within 48 hours, we had rockets for 110 kids. Uh, literally, within 48 hours, we had them. And so then we're launching rockets in the schoolyard, left, right, center, and everybody's excited about it. And then we decided, okay, what can we do next? Let's build an eight-foot rocket. Um, so we did, and it was probably about 10 pounds. And had I done due diligence, like the drone, droneography um, teacher, I would have looked into regulations, because apparently we were about three pounds over weight for what we did. Um, it's just a lot of potato fields. Um, but those kids, those two boys, they were crying to, because they didn't want to come to school. Now they were crying on the phone because their mom didn't want to come and pick them up after school if they stayed later. Um, those kids didn't want to read at the beginning of their grade six classroom. At the end of the year, they were going home and reading and writing reports that I hadn't even asked them to write, translating into French because they knew that I'd only read French from them, about aileron designs and fin designs for rockets. Um, we built a wind tunnel. We went to our lumber um, camps in uh, West Prince, um, near Bloomfield, and an auto glass place. And they just found out what we were doing. So they donated wood, they donated plexiglass, they donated the, the sono tube. They make a concrete to kind of footings and stuff for foundations with some of those tubes uh, for decks. Uh, so we got all this material donated to us. And uh, so, yeah, we. Had an awesome time. We created a foot rocket, 
but in that process, those boys latched on to literacy that previous to that they didn't even know was available to them. Um, so there's just different ways of engaging kids. And again, the technology, yeah, we were building a rocket. I didn't, as a teacher, say to myself, okay, here's this curricular expectation, or is the Francais, what's that again, outcome? Um, and uh, what am I going to do to do to reach this curricular outcome? It kind of became organic. The students kind of helped shepherd the projects, and we came up with projects every two weeks. Um, they even called the Ministry of National of Natural Resources and PEI, one of my little grade six girls, Carissa, she's probably this high, amazing hockey player, and she called the Ministry of Natural Resources to get some trees donated for another project, and they refused to talk to her. They're like, let me talk to your teacher. And she's like, you're not talking to my teacher, I'm the one calling you about this, right? <laughs> so this finally, and there's a little group of four girls standing there, I'm kind of chuckling to myself, because I know exactly how this is feeling on the other end of the line. Anyway, she convinced this gentleman, who ended up being an all-star, to come to the school to meet with her and her team, which she did, and they laid out this huge thing for Environment Week where they created tutorials, the students did this on their own, uh, for all the kids in the school to an instructional step-by-step -step in French uh, in a very Anglophone community on how to plant a tree, and they got all these seedlings donated, and they did workshops around the schoolyard. We got principal's permission to plant, and then they all went home with one. They organized a little this lunch initiative and tried to get a bunch of other schools involved. Like, if you get out of the way as a teacher and what you think should be done, um, long story short, my job became, okay, you want to do this project? Which curricular outcomes can I hit with this? Well, in the six years that I taught in PEI, I don't think there was one year where by May, I hadn't satisfied every curriculum like expectation in the book across all subjects in my classroom, which gave us May and June to experiment, prep them for the following year, et cetera, review some stuff from the previous uh, seven months. Um, so it works. I have a question for you. Yep. Um, some of these projects, I mean, they must fail other than so yeah. How do you get, how do you handle the, the uh, disappointments of the continuum still being engaged? Yeah. Not the, uh, um, turned off? The, Actually, I can't say we failed one yet. There hasn't been one project where we failed. Um, so in New Brunswick, we helped support 303 projects last year. In Nova Scotia, we're committed to doing 200. In my own classroom, they're happening left, right, and center. And there's only one that, I guess, failed, if you want to call it that, because we ran out of time. Uh, we created a video game using a Raspberry Pi and a Scratch, uh, but it has a physical component, right? Because you can program a sensor so I'm an advocate of healthy eating, but in this case, one of the students just, the running joke all year is that he loved KFC. So I let them create this video game about KFC where the end boss is this giant chicken with a bucket on his head. Um, and they generated all the assets, all the platforms, the little lava pools, all the bosses and the mini bosses, all the sound effects. We had a, two students that didn't want to do anything. They didn't want to do the music, they didn't want to do the dialogue, they didn't want to do the math or the coding. So I made them the project managers. Um, they did a great job. They had a little clipboard and kept all the other teams on kind of point. But in doing that, they were also deeply rooted into everything that was going on in the project. So they were learning stuff without even realizing they were learning it. They thought they were the big bosses, but they probably ended up with a better ensemble um, the project to Naples Kido. Um, we ran out of time on that one because it was going to be. <laughs> It's so foolish. Um, there's a target on the board, and we put a line of duct tape, and it was all wired to this, that little Raspberry Pi I was showing you, that $30 little microcomputer, um, so that when he ate 10 drumsticks, he would flash and become super jaded. And then the multiplayer component was that he had friends with a ball behind this line, and they had to hit the target. And if they hit the target, that's when he actually became super jaded, the light, the light would blink green for 10 seconds, and he would be invincible kind of thing. Um, so we got the hardware part working, we got all the assets generated, but we never got to complete it from start to finish. There was always a few things missing. So the game was semi-playable, but we ran out of time. Um, another failed example was 3D printers. Yeah, we put a lot of 3D printers into the classrooms in the Maritimes. One of them 
kept the company it kept breaking after six months and it's costing a fortune. So we went with PrinterBot because it came in kits and the kids had to build it themselves. So we figured a lot of learning comes from this. Uh, and it wasn't easy. And there's a student, I think he was in grade 11, um, he busted the belts by accident and the kid was in tears, his teacher told me, because he let down the team kind of thing, right? Uh, but we found the replacement parts and unfortunately that printer's still not running. Uh, and the, they got it last May and it's now October and they haven't figured it out. But just like those kids with 107 times to program the thing, they'll eventually get it. And when they do, it'll be awesome for them. And the message I was sending them was, better now in a safe environment in the classroom than when you're an engineer working on a NASA project and something blows up uh, taking people to Mars. Yep. I find it interesting the questions about failure. Um, I work with kids in gaming. Yeah. And um, there's that, I don't know if you've seen that, there's a um, um, Jenkins quote, the worst thing you can, can, can say about homework is that it's too hard and the worst thing you can say about gaming is it's too easy. Right. And kids, you see kids, especially kids with learning disabilities who go through gaming and they fail over and over, they get killed over and over and over and over again, and that's where they learn. Yeah, the challenge. So like, we, failure is a, like a, 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 an essential part of learning. Yeah. Um, you learn better once you fail. Um, if you did something wrong, you would go back and fix it. And I think the, the idea that, um, you know, asking like what failed, I'm sure in every project there are hundreds of little failures to sure. that work the way they planned sure. them. And that's, that's part of the learning that's essential. Mm -hmm. And we take that out of, of, you know, I was an elementary teacher, you take that out, you don't want kids to fail stuff, but they need to fail stuff. Yeah. It's, it's part of the process. It's part of the learning process. You know, it's, it's essential. And, and I think we, we take that out, and then they go and find it somewhere else. You know, they go and get killed, you know, whatever game it is. <laughs> and there's research that shows that gaming, it's all challenge based. Yeah. And it's that perseverance and it builds that perseverance. Oh, thank you. And you shared the, um, was it the scribbler? Mm -hmm. And also Game Maker, she shared, we're not using Game Maker at Brilliant Labs working with the hundreds of schools yet, but Game Maker is an awesome 2D kind of RPG, and I just found out that apparently there's 3D as well. Um, it's part of programming, like maybe 14 plus for 3D, okay. and it's not intuitive, like the right. community would be better. <laughs> um, I feel a bit foolish kind of sharing all these resources when I know there's probably a lot of expertise in this room, and you guys probably have a lot of stuff that you want to share, so I don't know, maybe the last little bit can... Oh, I don't know. How much time do we have left? None. 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 None.